Bonjour, guten Tag, hola, namaste, ni hao, jambo, salam, xin chao, chem repsu, and a big hello to one and all. Welcome to the virtual high-level policy dialogue by E-Trade for All. That's an organization of 32 partners worldwide led by the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. Today, we're going to be talking about a crucial issue and specifically, it is about development challenges in COVID-19. What's the role that e-commerce and digital trade play? My name is Karen Lam and I am going to be your moderator as well as your host. And what a lineup we have for you. Preeminent leaders, business people, policy makers, people essentially who have a stake in e-commerce and policy making to make sure that e-commerce is a benefit that can be shared by all. Now I'm gonna start off the proceedings today with a little bit of your participation. And now what's gonna happen is you will find at the bottom of your screen, a chat box. I want you to click on that chat box and the sidebar will appear. So will you do that for me? Click on the chat box and talk back to me. What do you, I want you to say? Specifically, since we're talking about e-commerce, I want you to type for me, or really for all of us, what was the last item you bought online? What was the last item you bought online? I promise I won't say who said what, I just want to know what specifically. Tennis balls, Birkenstock shoes, toilet paper, very important, perfume, uh, office supplies, music, music CDs, food, yes, a skateboard, wow. And you didn't even have to try the skateboard. Okay, a Cuba cab drive, fantastic. Toilet paper again. Sounds like a very popular item indeed. And vitamins, wonderful, a tablet, and even art. Wow. Well, the last item I bought online was furniture. I bought a writing table. Never in my life would I have imagined that I would buy furniture online. But hey, this is how times have changed. And, you know, the topic of e-commerce really is as personal as it is professional. And what a time to talk about e-commerce and COVID-19, because this time last year, the World Health Organization officially declared the coronavirus a pandemic. Yep, that was one year ago. I know it may seem like ages ago, but certainly it's just been one year that COVID-19 has been declared a pandemic. And it's timely that we are gathered here today because we really need to sit back and ask ourselves now, what now? So this event today centers around a study that was launched and prepared by E-Trade for All. And it will talk about the trends and the impact of COVID-19 on e-commerce and digi digital trade worldwide. And we're gonna hear about those findings in a while. But for now, I wanna quickly give you a rundown of what to expect over the next one and a half hours. And it's going to be, I assure you, not going to be rather a dull moment. So first off, I'm going to start off with a bang. We're going to have a conversation with the Acting Secretary General of UNTAD. Uh, and after that, we will then sink our teeth into this pivotal study by E-Trade for All. What really are the regional and global trends that have been exhibited? This will be followed by some insights from Latin America and the Caribbean from the ECLAC representative, and that's the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, before we hear a word from one of the sponsors of the E-Trade for All study. When that is done, we will then sit down and have a panel. And this is going to be an interesting panel of four speakers, both from the private as well as the public sectors who will share their views and their insights into the development of e-commerce since COVID-19 hit. And finally, 
we end off strong. We're going to have, and we're very privileged to be able to have with us the president of the United Nations General Assembly, who will join us for his closing remarks. So shall we open up with a person who has been instrumental in both global as well as regional changes and, and policy making amid economic change. And she is, of course, the acting secretary of UNCTAD, Ms. Isabel Duhon. Ms. Duhon, how are you? Hi, and thank you, Karen. And I have to ask you this question since I've asked everyone else. What was the last thing you bought online? Yes, I was thinking on that, uh, reading the, the chat. So my last uh, purchase was a gift for my grandson, uh, a, a board game, uh, Harry, Harry Potter board game. But the specificity is that I bought it directly to the producer. And I went to the website of the producer in order to buy it to produce close to the place where it has to be delivered. So and intentionally, I bought directly to the producers in order to order uh, the, the game there to the producer. How precious, what, what effort. I hope he appreciates it. I hope, yes, it is the case, I, <laughs> I can assure you. <laughs> All right, let's get down to business, shall we, Mr. Huan? Now, tell us about this global study that was done by E-Trade for All. Why is it so important? And more specifically, why should we care? But we have all uh, seen that the last year, all a lot of things changed regarding, uh, of course, digital issues. And it's why we are there to discuss through the screen. Uh, a lot of things change. Our societies are totally transformed. And it's true that this uh, boom in the digitalization and especially in e-commerce is something which is a, a fact that we have to observe and to learn about what was happened and who, how it could happen in the future. Because we knew that, we knew that, that um, yes, a, a certain digital gap existed already. But with the COVID-19 crisis and with the, the boom in, in digitalization, we have seen this digital gap as a really key issue regarding the difference between those uh, who do have access to uh, digital issues and also purchase, etc., online, and those uh, who don't. And that's something which is key for us because that's, it, it has to be, of course, uh, equally distributed. Yeah, so while it's a good thing, we, we have heard so many wonderful stories that have come out of this e-commerce boom. As you have pointed out, there is this problem of the digital divide. Um, tell us what really, you know, the world or, or what, what we can do individually to, to try to address and perhaps to even close this gap if we can. But we have, uh, this report shows how important it is that the countries, and especially the developing countries, could be prepared in order to address the, the question on, a, on a, an appropriate way. There was a question of understanding how it works. It's also a question of uh, the condition that you have to, to ensure. And we are doing a lot in UNCTAD with the support of e trade for all about e-readiness assessment, how they can take into consideration the question of a legal framework. That's very important. If there is no predictability or no security for the producers or for the consumer, never the e-commerce as such will be developed. So aspect as a legal framework, but also logistic aspect, distribution, uh, uh, and, and the way to, to really serve the, the, the final client. Uh, but also the question of uh, the post union, how you can send in some countries is not so easy. And I would like to give you an example. When I was visiting Burkina Faso, Ouagadougou, one, one year and a half ago, I met a, a group of young people, young men, no women, unfortunately, and they were developing um, a project of e-commerce in the city. But there is no address as such. I mean, there is address and streets, but nobody nobody used the, the, the name of the streets or the number uh, in the street. So it's why they used the, the water meter number. Everybody knows the water, num the water meter number. And it was a way to identify the client, to ensure a good distribution, but also to bypass the problem of data protection because it's not a name, it's a number. So it was really creative. And the, I frankly, I was uh, uh, impressed uh, and about this amazing capacity to adapt 
uh, e-commerce to a situation which is very specific in this city. So I think that there is a lot of creativity, but they need support. And it means that the governments, the authorities, the private sector has to be prepared in order to deliver uh, in, in digital matters. Right, and you know, fantastic example there. I remember having to send over a, a, a whole load of uh, SIM cards, for t uh, phone, mobile phone SIM cards to various places in Nigeria. We thought, you know, oh, piece of cake. <laughs> it turns out that it is actually a big task because there are no official addresses. And so in, in many ways, that's, that's really low hanging fruit for governments to, to, to put into place. But in your experience, you've mentioned several things that can be done, the legal frameworks, you know, the, the postal services. What has been perhaps the most effective strategy that you've seen put in place since the pandemic hit? That's what this report is about. Uh, it's really sharing experiences uh, which happened in some countries, uh, concrete examples of what government has done in order to support in this very critical period, startup or companies in order to, well, to ensure services and not only goods, it's also services because a lot of services without the possibility to exchange in the, in the lockdown period, it was also important that services could be also accessible online. So uh, there was a lot of things that uh, uh, we can learn about what was happening sometimes from the very small level, the, the startup level, but also from the point of view or the experiences from some governments doing more than in the past because it, they were really uh, uh, obliged to address the question of delivering goods and services to all the population. Mm. And, you know, if we talk about e-commerce uh, pre-pandemic, as opposed to where we now, we'd like to think we're in the recovery phase, but we all know that in different parts of the world, they're not quite in recovery phase just yet. But if we look at the situation pre-pandemic, uh, perhaps one of the biggest uh, issues that you've had to deal with was that of poverty. But now that we've got COVID-19, then there is the digital and technology issues that need to be addressed. And suddenly you find yourself, I would imagine, handling, juggling a few more balls than you had expected. Right, totally right. It's true that, uh, and it's totally understandable when a government is uh, facing so many problems regarding social issues, poverty, and, and a lot of sometimes post-conflict situations, sometimes a lot of difficult situations. It's obvious that for them, the first thing that they have to do is really to address that. But what we tried, what we learned from this period of the, the COVID-19, it's that you have to do both, not only priorities regarding social and poverty issue, which are of course key, but also at the same time, develop a, a, a learning and understanding and developing digital issues. And not only because it's the new driving force of the world, it's also because it could help in order to fight against poverty, to fight against, I don't know, bad crops for, for rural areas, etc. So I think that it's important to let understand that we have to do, or the government or in the developing countries with this experience, I think that they realize that it's important to do the, the two things together and not prioritize one on another. I think that digital divide has to be uh, uh, addressed through uh, uh, a very, very on short term investment, investment, but also involvement of all the authorities. Do you find yourself, Mr. Horn, more busy now than before COVID hit? Yeah, true. True, I think that in the contact that we have with here, ambassador or interlocutors of minister of trade or minister of IT. Yes, we realize, but they realize, and it's normal uh, that uh, it's for them more important to do it today. And UNTAD received a lot of requests for e-readiness assessment, support, uh, share of experience, and E-Trade for All is, is also existing for that in order to provide to all our partners uh, experiences uh, updating uh, because it's a sector where the things are evolving so rapidly that uh, you have to follow that closely. So I hope that it can help them. But yes, they are now totally aware that they have to do something. And it's not only a question of e-commerce as such, it's also what will happen with the new tools, artificial intelligence, blockchain, internet of things, all these frontier technologies are really key for them if they, 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 they could become not only a client 
of the big platform, but be an active player in, the, in this uh, new framework. And I think that now it's better perceived, better understand, and we will continue our efforts to, to support them in this uh, uh, difficult avenue for them. Mm. And another group of people that, that I would imagine that you'd also be looking at is that of the position of women, because in any developmental situation, especially when you have such rapid economic changes uh, in perhaps the least developing countries or even the developing countries, is the women who are typically disadvantaged. So how will you, um, what carrot, shall I say, will you dangle in front of governments to say, you have to include women in this digital uh, boom that, that we're exper uh, experiencing right, right now. Why, why should women be involved? First of all, because it's the half of the humanity. So it's ridiculous to, to exclude uh, the half of your population from the possibility to be an entrepreneur or even a client of uh, online issues. So of course it's uh, uh, totally obvious. Nevertheless, in addition, because it was the case before the COVID-19, we did a lot regarding entrepreneurship for women and they are really, and they were during this lockdown, very, very courageous. A lot of women, not only in the domestic issues, etc., but a lot of them having an activity online did a lot in order to really uh, uh, address all the problems related to the, the, the new situation. So it's true that for them, it's also an opportunity because Sometimes, and even before the COVID, they are excluded from the, the male-dominated environment regarding business uh, in a lot of countries. And for them, the possibility to, have to start an activity online is a direct contact with the client, bypassing all the intermediaries. And I think that it's something which is very useful for them. In addition, mm -hmm. uh, when a woman uh, starts a business, the benefit of the business is really benefiting to the whole community very soon. And the, 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 the way to, to let grow the, 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 the business is a way to let grow not only the business, but to let grow the benefit for the community. And that is something which is very useful for in this period uh, of socio socioeconomic crisis. So yes, I think that no, uh, uh, it's important. And we started a very interesting project called Eat Rate for Women. And it was a way to identify mentoring, show to uh, women who maybe are a little bit reluctant, not knowing the things, etc., that there are people and women succeeding, uh, succeed, and they they could tell and share how they did in order mm -hmm. to develop a, a business online. Yep. So take note of that, ladies and gentlemen. E trade for women. That's something that uh, yes. Untad has started, and it's growing, and it's really gaining traction. So on that note, Ms. Duhon, I am going to wish you a belated, happy International Women's Day. And indeed, this is something that we will celebrate and will continue to celebrate. So I'm just going to let you off just for this little while. Uh, if you will, do come back as we end up later on today uh, um, to, to give us your closing thoughts and remarks, because we'd love to be able to start as well as to end with you. So for now, we're going to move our attention to the setting of the scene. And what is that scene? That scene is really the E-Trade for All paper, which is the reason for this particular dialogue in the first place. So we've gotten a high level view from Mr. Horn on the developments in e-commerce uh, globally, regionally. Now let's sink our teeth into the specifics. Uh, for that, I am going to call on the Director of the Division of Technology and Logistics at UNCTAD, and she is Ms. Shamika Sirimani. Ms. Sirimani, please. Thank you, Karen. Let me now share my screen and a PowerPoint. Oh, there's something happening. Just give me a minute, Karen. This always happens. Yeah, it I know. Twenty percent of the time, out of five, uh, out of five calls we make, there you go. You're on screen now. You can see. Okay. Yes. I have to do a little more juggling here. Let me give me a few seconds. OK, 
Okay. Okay, I think I'm on. So thank you, Karen. And uh, it's good to follow uh, what uh, Isabel was saying because this really report uh, reflects her thoughts and her own experience in visiting different developing countries. So let me uh, say a very big welcome to all of you out there. And also thank you very much for giving the opportunity to present to you the main findings of the global review of the impact of COVID-19 on e-commerce. And this is, as Karen, you mentioned, this is conducted by UNCTAD and our great E-Trade for All partners. So e-commerce has been playing a very big role and it is increasingly growing role and as part of the digital, you know, the wider digital economy. It has provided and it is providing new ways of facilitating the sustainable development goals and bringing both new opportunities and also new challenges. And I will take you through some of these opportunities and challenges as we go along. Now, as you both said, the pandemic has reinforced the importance of addressing existing barriers. This is very, very clear in, in this report. This pandemic has plunged the world economy into the worst recession since the World War II. In fact, in 2020, the global economy shrank by 4.3%, and this is much bigger than during the 2008-2009 global financial crisis. And the lockdowns and other preventive measures that the government, the governments you know, put in place to basically stop the spread of the virus have disrupted economic activities in ways for which we were not prepared. And it was very clear when the lockdowns came our way. So as lockdowns became the new normal, businesses and consumers increasingly went digital. And this is something that you saw when, you, when people were saying that they were ordering toilet papers online. And this is what happened to all of us. And it provided us with the purchasing opportunities and also uh, uh, you know, to purchase more goods and services online. In fact, the share of e-commerce of global retail trade is es estimated to have gone, gone up from 14% in 2019 to 17% in 2020. And I'm sure that this is an underestimation because one of the things is there's nothing called e-commerce statistics. They are all very patched up numbers that we collect and present to you. And the businesses and consumers that were able to go digital have helped mitigate the economic downturn caused by the pandemic. And, but they also have sped up a digital transition that will have lasting impacts on our societies and daily lives for which not everyone is prepared today. There's a big transformation coming and it is coming very fast at us. And the very big concern is that the countries that harness the potential of e-commerce will be better placed to benefit from global markets for their goods and services. But those that fall, fail to do so risk falling behind e even further. And this has been a very concern for us in Antar and also among our network. So let me give you a couple of regional trends now. Mario will take us through some more. So our report, for example, shows that the strong uptake in e-commerce across regions. So this did not happen in one region. It's, it's a, a cross-regional phenomena. And Latin America's online marketplace, Mercado Libre, for example, sold twice as many articles per day in the second quarter of 2020 compared with the same period the previous year. Mario, we will, you will take us through some of these numbers. An African e-commerce platform, Jumia, for example, reported 50% jump in transactions during the first six months of 2020. And the lots of such numbers are there in the report. Now, Consumers in emerging economies have made the greatest shift to online shopping. In fact, the 50% of them, we believe, 
will continue to shop online more often than before. So the transformation has happened and it is happening very fast in emerging economies. And also we want to bring to your attention that the, this pandemic has also benefited the world's leading digital platforms and most solutions being used for e-commerce, teleworking as we all know, and cloud computing. And these are provided by a relatively small number of large companies based mainly in China and the United States. Now to the other side of the story, in many of the world's least developed countries, consumers and businesses were not able to capitalize on the new e-commerce opportunities due to persistent bottlenecks and barriers that uh, our ASG just mentioned, lack of connectivity, costly broadband services, you know, no payment systems, lack of consumers trust on online activities, digital, lack of digital skills, and the list goes on. In fact, these gaps are also reflected in our E-Trade readiness assessments. It's a key spin-off from the E-Trade for All initiative that we have. And we have done these diagnostic studies in 27 countries and uh, you know, mostly LDCs and some developing countries. And the story emerging is very much the same. So the risk is that the huge digital divides that already existed between and within countries will only worsen in the wake of this pandemic. The result will be even deeper in our qualities that would threaten to derail progress on SDGs. And I am, you know, this is, has been our concern for, for, for a while now. So to now to let me take you to through quickly about the policy responses and so and, and recommendations. So we say in this report, as the shift to the digital economy has been accelerated by this pandemic. There is a need for greater efforts by three main stakeholders to secure more inclusive benefits from e-commerce and the digital economy. First, the governments. Governments need to prioritize national digital readiness so that more local businesses can become producers in the digital economy and not just consumers. Building and enabling e-commerce ecosystem requires changes in public policy and business practices to improve the digital infrastructure, facilitate digital payments, establish appropriate legal regulatory frameworks, uh, and so forth. So the, and the approach must be holistic and it cannot be one ministry's business. ICT ministry is doing one thing and trade ministry is doing another thing, industry is doing something. It has to be a holistic approach to digital development and their policies and strategies should not be made in silos and it would not simply not work. And the second recommendations are for the digital entrepreneurs and they must become a central focus of efforts to capture value in the digital economy. This requires faster digitalization for smaller businesses. I think this is something our ASG has been saying and emphasizing more attention to digital entrepreneurship and especially for women, better capabilities to capture and harness data and strong regulatory frameworks for creating and capturing value in this new and emerging economy. And the third set of recommendations are for the international community, including development partners, the United Nations, the regional economic communities and organizations concerned with digital development we all also need to find new, bold, and smart ways to work with governments and the private sector to leverage these opportunities. So we also need to come together, the international communities, to deliver on the digital aspirations of developing countries. So only through active collaboration can we ensure that e-commerce and the digital economy will play a powerful and positive role in national and international efforts to build back better. In fact, this pandemic has demonstrated the importance of ensuring consistency and avoiding duplication in international efforts. And for over the past four years, 
the e trade for all initiative has shown the potential for collaboration and adding value, especially in the, in the least developed countries. So this is for us is a good practice example that we, we intend with our partners of 32 uh, agencies intend to keep on going at. So Karen, just to end, I just also want to mention that this all this work will not have been able without generous financial support from our donors. And uh, here, let me uh, thank especially Estonia, Germany, and Netherlands for this particular work, uh, the, 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 the study that we have done. And let me also thank the CAST Foundation, which basically sponsored the Global Review, which provides the basis of our conversation today. And I'm very happy that uh, Mr. Vintak is able to join and take this conversation forward. So let me stop here. Thank you, Kenneth. Thank you, Sirimani. Sirimani. And yes, uh, Mr. Vitznek will come on in a little while. But before he does, though, uh, Ms. Sirimani mentioned Latin America and he meant she also mentioned Mario. Now, this is where I'm going to bring Mario Castillo into the picture to give us a view of what's happening over there in Latin America and the Caribbean, because he is the director of the International Trade and, Indus uh, and Integration at ECLAC, which is the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. So Mr. Castillo, tell us what's happening in your part of the world. Okay, thank you, thank you, Karen. And uh, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, I would like to thank also Isabel and Tamika for, the, for this event. And I would like to present a some uh, fact about the uh, Latin American and the Caribbean in ten of the presentation that Tamika mentioned. Uh, uh, in, in a few work, I, I would like to give you uh, three messages that I think that's important for, for Latin America and the Caribbean. First, uh, there are in a momentum where the e-commerce and digital trade uh, uh, can be an, a key element of the digital agenda of many of the, the many Latin American countries that already is in place. The second message is uh, in the in the in the pandemic context, there are a big asymmetry in terms of the domestic market in e-commerce and cross-border uh, e-commerce. And this is the reason that why for Latin America is important moving in terms of the uh, in terms of the global market. As, as, as you know, uh, uh, ICLA is part of the, the ITRE for all, and we work with, uh, with UNTAD and other regional commission, and, and we participate and, and, and prepare two important uh, reports. One of them that uh, present uh, Jamaica and the other, it would focus in, uh, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. And that's very useful because uh, we have an, a, 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 a technical secretary for digital agenda in the region, the, the digital agenda is ILAC uh, 2022. This is a very active agenda. It's a very successful experience in this region that involves all of the Latin American countries. And we have a specific uh, agenda in terms of many topics. One of them is e-commerce. E of course, there, there are different uh, 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 approach for, for the country, but we have a very comprehensive. Uh, uh, next, please. Uh, uh, the, the one element is important to try to understand what's the, the context of the, of the pandemic in Latin America. Uh, uh, the region has been uh, uh, the most impacted region in the world in, in terms of the magnify uh, structural gap, inequality, for instance, and the financial risk, risk uh, uh, rise in employment, and the decrease of the GDP, 7.7%. Uh, but uh, the ICLA proposal uh, is, uh, is, is uh, uh, develop an approach and a transformative recovery with focus in key sector, in the dynamic sector. And one of them, of course, is the digital economy. Also are related with renewable energy, electromobility, healthcare, bioeconomy. 
but the digital economy is a key element in, 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 in our strategy. Next, please. Uh, what is our approach? Uh, our, our analytical approach is, is try to understand how to how accelerate the digital uh, transformation uh, in the continent of, of the post-crisis uh, recovery. Well, the idea, would, of course, we are uh, face a, 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 an important economic crisis, but we have to uh, converse with the new reality in terms of the online, uh, the new online consumer model, but also with the business model of the all of the sector in the economy, it, also the emerging of the new technology, where is is important the infrastructure of, of the digital economy of. Uh, 5G, uh, cloud computer, Internet of Things, uh, 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 robot, and other emerging technology. And then we emphasize an agenda with, with priority in different levels. One of them is with social inclusion uh, agenda, other related with the productive resilient, and also with uh, sustainability. Uh, next. Uh, please. Uh, in terms of the, for instance, is one of example. Uh, 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 in terms of the uh, the, the social uh, priority, uh, in Latin America, more than 40 million uh, household without internet connection, and this is at the first uh, priority, especially in the context of the pandemic, and in terms of access to services, access to education, access to uh, remote work. And the uh, ICLAC uh, uh, have proposed invest 1% invest of the GDP and annually in a basis digital basket uh, to universalize broadband access. This basket is consists in, in, in device, in laptop, tablet, a smart home, and uh, internet plan. And since this is, this is an important initiative because we have to resolve the gap of the access that already there are in the region because 33% uh, uh, of the urban household and, and seven more, more than 70% of rural area are not connected uh, so far. Uh, next, please. In the context of the pandemic, and, uh, like I mentioned, in the Latin America, uh, you can see an uh, important asymmetry. You can see in the Mercado Libre is the main uh, uh, marketplace in the region. Uh, 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 show an important growth in terms of the uh, e-commerce. But on the other side, uh, uh, the cross-border e-commerce flow decrease. What that means? That means that in the region, uh, we have an, uh, an, a weakness of the regional digital market. And this is, is, is one of the a key element in terms of connectivity, in terms of, of the logistic, uh, in terms of the regulation. Uh, next, uh, please. And finally, uh, what is the conclusion in the in the, the framework that that the, the the report? Of course, uh, the pandemic reinforced the policy agenda to strengthen the role of e-commerce in the recovery. Uh, for us, for the region, it's important the, the coordination uh, with the public, a uh, 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 private sector, and also internal reinforce the national digital agenda in the context of this strategy. Uh, it's important also uh, try to understand what this kind of the public policy need the new approach in the digital industry policy. You know, because one of the important aspects is related with the competition and how to regulate, for instance, the big marketplace platform and develop a new space on the region. Uh, in a specific area of e-commerce, of course, digital connectivity is important, trade facilitation and logistics while working with the main block uh, uh, of integration in, in Latin America, like to Mercosur or like to 
uh, Pacific Alliance and, uh, and other uh, mechanisms of integration. And the idea is to put the, the digital uh, strategy and the e-commerce one, one of the key pillar and element. Uh, uh, and finally, regulated, the regulatory framework for electronic payment is important in terms of to facilitate. And I think that there are many opportunities in, in, in this uh, regional uh, dialogue. And finally, I would like to thank to, to uh, UNTAG and, and all of the, the team that work in the, in the report uh, are very useful for the work that are already in place in the region. And, and, and thank you so much for this space. Thank you so much, Mr. Castillo. As you can all see, there is a lot of work for all of us to be doing. Uh, for now, though, we would like to acknowledge uh, one of the generous sponsors of the E-Trade for All study, and that is the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, or the CAS Foundation. I have the pleasure to welcome its Director of Multilateral Dialogue for the Geneva Office, Olaf Witznik. Do you share with us some of your thoughts? Yes, gladly. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction, also from the um, uh, kind word uh, from Mrs. Siriman. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we are very pleased that our office uh, was able to contribute to the launch of this report. I rep represent here the Geneva office of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, which is a German political foundation and which has a network of over 100 offices worldwide, including now here in Geneva. Our core aim is always to raise awareness about the work of the multilateral bodies here in, G in Geneva towards um, policymakers and politicians, not only in Germany, but also in um, Europe and in the world. And uh, one hour of our missions is also to support, whenever we can, initiatives which can contribute to reaching the SDGs. It is in this context that we decided to support um, this global review on the impact of COVID-19 on e-commerce and digital trade. And we share your assessment, of course, that e-commerce has a potential of opening business opportunities, both domestically and internationally, as well as diversifying international trade channels. Some of our offices actually have already been publishing and working a lot on this uh, topic with various stakeholders. Um, for example, our office, uh, Social and Economic Governance in Asia, or our um, Trade and Development Program in Latin America. And we see also in our offices on the ground that e-commerce readiness is one of the key factors to boost recovery in the context of this crisis. And in many countries where we work actually with representatives of businesses, business associations, we see the huge potential, which uh, if, if this can be harnessed. Now, your report is therefore very timely because it brings together, I think, the lessons learned from various regions. Um, and restoring international trade will, of course, be one of the key priorities in the post-COVID recovery and to build back better. Reducing barriers in the area of e-commerce will be absolutely crucial. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I will not, a lot of things have already been said, and so I, I won't repeat uh, the key findings of the report, um, but I think one of the uh, added values also of the report has been that it looks at various stakeholders at the same time, not only at national governments, not only what the international community, particularly international organizations can do, or international donors, but also what one can do to bridge the digital divide, which you do not have only on the international level, so among countries, but actually within countries. Um, some have mentioned the gender dimension, others, uh, other dimensions are of course between different economic sectors. And therefore, um, one, of the, uh, one of the biggest pluses of this um, report has been its, uh, very, its wide scope and its uh, comprehensiveness also regarding um, uh, these actors. And actually, a lot of steps which have to be taken now in order to best uh, harness the potential of e-commerce um, will demand a lot of very different steps of very different actors. And this will demand, of course, a regular conversation between international organizations and donors, national governments, and the private sector. And UNCTAD is certainly one of those international fora where this conversation can, be take, can take place. Um, and building on your projects such as the E-Trade for All platform or the E-Commerce Week, I think we can exchange about lessons learned from the pandemic, best uh, practices, 
and inform all stakeholders about uh, successful e-commerce strategies. I will therefore not delay this interesting discussion any longer. And I'm looking forward to hearing from our experts uh, in the panel about their experiences and their recommendations. Thanks a lot. Sorry. Hi. So thank you very much, Mr. Wisnik. Uh, and one of the things that I'm hearing over and over again, both in your uh, 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 presentation as well as Ms. Sirimane's presentation, is, is this these two words, dialogue and collaboration. Dialogue and collaboration. And so it's interesting that today and right now, I'm going to bring in this panel of stakeholders, both from the public sector as well as the private sector, who will come in to talk about e-commerce and digital trade and how it's impacted their operations and their communities. But before I bring them in, though, here's something for you, my audience, to participate in. Uh, you will get to ask questions of the panelists in the Q&A chat box. You see at the bottom next to chat, there is that box called Q&A. Put in your questions there and uh, we will address them. But I must say from the outset that I cannot promise to address all your questions, but we will address as much as possible. Uh, I will make time uh, as much as possible to get uh, the panelists to answer them. So it is now my pleasure to call upon our panelists and let me introduce them first before I bring them all in to talk about their various issues. They are the permanent representative of the Republic of Kazakhstan to the United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva, Her Excellency Jana Aichinova. Welcome. Hello. And the Under Secretary of State at the Ministry of Commerce in Cambodia, His Excellency Samheng Bora, calling in from Phnom Penh. Welcome, Your Excellency. Mitsu. <laughs> and the Director of Government Relations and Public Policy of Mikado Libre, uh, Latin America's largest e-commerce marketplace. And he is Francois Martins calling in from Brasilia, over in Brazil. Hello. And finally, we have the founder of Peak Me Naturals. It's a company producing aromatherapy products based out of Indonesia. Arlene Chandro, hello. And you're Hello. now in Japan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us and just making the time to, to, to just bring in this dialogue and collaboration that the speakers prior to this session have been talking about. So let's start off. I'd like to start off just trying to tap on your own personal experiences, especially those from the businesses on, on this e-commerce boom. So we've seen it from the high level now What's it like running a business? How has it changed? So I'm going to start the ball rolling. Uh, ladies first, Ms. Chandra, um, tell us how business has changed for you pre-pandemic and right now. Well, to start off with, uh, I started the, my business five years ago in the online platform. So with the pandemic, uh, when the pandemic started, we already had a head start. We are already in the online marketplaces. We already have our own website. But it has changed um, the general public consumption practices that they are now more receptive to buying things online um, and the more availability of payment options, which makes it much easier for people to uh, purchase our product. What um, I have seen in the in terms of how we do business is the collaboration because this um, exchange of information and how people are more open to using Zoom for meetings and using other virtual meeting platforms make me have more access to collaborators from the nationwide in Indonesia, which I might not have known before. So we have launched um, several initiatives since the pandemic started one of which is um, setting up the foundation for a training and educational center for aromatherapy, the first in Indonesia, which is going to be um, in the future hybrid, but right now we're doing it online. 
Very exciting indeed. And if we're talking about aromatherapy, it's got to do with health. And definitely health is one of those issues that, uh, you know, that, that's, that's concerning all of us. So can I now turn my attention to Mr. Martin's uh, Mercado Libre? It serves 18 countries in the region. So I'm going to read to you Precisely. your most recent your most recent fourth quarter 2020 results. Um, I know you know it, but really it's for the benefit of our audience. So here's some numbers. Net revenue, 1.3 billion, up 150%. Total payment volume, 16 billion, up 135%. Gross merchandise volume, 6.6 .6 billion, up 110%. You know, in the days of old, when you have double digit growth, that's supposed to be superb. We're not talking about double digit growth anymore. We're talking about triple digit growth. So what do you attribute, Mr. Martins, this phenomenal growth in your numbers? Hi, um, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here to contribute. Um, actually, we've had a fairly challenging year in 2020. It, although it does not seem like it, and those numbers are uh, highly um, representative of the effort we put in with our collaborators at this company. But, you know, with the pandemic going on, you cannot uh, avoid uh, respecting social distancing. And I think it contributed a lot. What happened really is we were uh, in a position to offer the services that sellers and buyers needed uh, there for them to be able to remain at home and, and be able to keep safe. So what we did really was put in place all the digital services that we were developing for the following years. We just accelerated that. And we offered them uh, in a faster way. So uh, sellers that were uh, uh, forced to close their stores to be able to continue doing business, although they didn't have access directly to their buyers, to their communities around them, and that also changed their behavior because suddenly they had access to the entire country, the entire region in some cases, okay? So um, this was one aspect of, of what happened. Also, the people buying things online suddenly had access to a much larger uh, panel of sellers and goods and prices and uh, circumstances in which they could acquire what they needed. And suddenly also they could acquire all the things that they did not think to buy online, they would think of doing so now because they didn't want to leave their homes. So I think those two factors at this moment were crucial and the, we were able to develop the tools that were needed for that to, to follow on. So it's based on Ms. Romani's report and what, what I'm hearing from you in terms of user behavior, that's going to be something that we will, that has changed for good. The question is, how sustainable is this exponential growth? Are we going to see a tapering off of the numbers in terms of growth? You know, what we've seen during this year is we have 57 million new users of those 4.9 million new sellers. So this is a really uh, uh, categorical behavior, uh, behavioral change, okay? So I don't think this is going to go down. What you see is, you know, we, we've gone through a threshold. This is a new step, a new base, and e-commerce is going to develop from this new base on. Uh, I'm not promising that we'll have triple digit growth for, new, for 2021. We'll do our You're best. You're gonna be disappointing your shareholders now. <laughs> I cannot promise anything in that sense, but what I, what I can promise though is that we are building on new things that weren't, weren't going to be available uh, in the planning because we didn't have the capacity for that uh, planning, planned. And uh, now we do have that in place. So um, uh, my colleague mentioned payment solutions we do have them in place that we're not going to be able. And I think that's a new paradigm. Very exciting indeed. I'm going to turn my attention now to the, the, the public sector, to the policy makers. So uh, Excellency Ajinova, now Kazakhstan has also seen e-commerce volume doubling, if not tripling uh, because of the lockdowns, because of the quarantine. Can you please share with us what are some of the recent e-commerce activities and policy developments in Kazakhstan? 
Thank you, Karen. Thank you for inviting me to this very important forum. And I'm very, uh, I'll, I'll be very glad to share with you the recent developments in Kazakhstan. As you have rightly mentioned, the pandemic has revealed a serious perspective for further development of e-commerce and growing opportunities for businesses as well as consumers. And I would like to mention that Kazakhstan is a landlocked country and development of e-commerce was a priority for our national economic development prior to uh, pandemics as well. And the volume of uh, the e-commerce market of Kazakhstan in 2019 uh, increased by 1.8 times and totaled approximately 1.7 billion US dollars. And uh, during the pandemic in Kazakhstan, online trade and online payment transactions have been significantly increased. And in the first half of 2020, for which we do have statistics at this stage, the volume of online trade amounted to almost 1 billion US dollars. And overall, the share of e-commerce in retail trade grew 5% in 2019 to from 5% in 2019 to 9.4% in 2020. So as I have mentioned, the government was engaged in development of e-commerce for a while and digitalization program has been launched in Kazakhstan and uh, with the objective to increase competitiveness of e-commerce sector, the government is implementing a set of important measures through development of services economy which is important for us as for landlocked country, one more time, and modernization of technologies, hardware. So uh, the government's efforts are mainly focused in three areas, which is first encouragement of micro and small and medium-sized enterprises to switch into online businesses. And second is development of e-commerce ecosystem and uh, cross-border digital trade and third is facilitation of active participation of consumers and public at large in e-commerce. So as a result of implementation of these measures, it is expected to increase the share of e-commerce by 15% and to increase the number of active online buyers to 7.7 .7 million people. And I would like to mention that we are, our population's number is 18.5 billion. So it's a significant portion of the population are being targeted. So I'll stop here at this stage. If you have any questions, I'll continue. Thank you. Yeah, we, you know, we're going to be moving along in this conversation. So chip in as and when. So yes. I'll, I'll, I'll ask um, Excellency Samheng at this point. Uh, we've seen what Kazakhstan is doing and we have had uh, news about the launch of an e-commerce strategy that yes. you have been directly involved in. Uh, yes. in Cambodia. So the thing is, um, uh, Excellency Samheng, tell us what you aim to achieve with this official launch of an e-commerce strategy. Well, thank you for having me here today. Um, and um, I guess it's evening here, so it's a lovely evening to everyone. Um, uh, so basically the, the e-commerce strategy came in part uh, to, the, um, to the government's intent on creating a better um, ecosystem for e-commerce in general, and as, especially for, for, for entrepreneurship in general. Um, I think it started out from the phase four of the regular, uh, rectangular strategy as well, and the NSDP, as well as influenced by, I guess all of these, uh, uh, some of the projects that we are partnering with EIF to, to do as well with the, and UNDP. And this include the, um, the, the, um, the Cambodia trade integration strategy um, that goes into 2019 and 2023. Um, all of this comes together uh, in a combination where we want to push um, the new generation of, of uh, I guess generation is the wrong word, the, in, the new industrial revolution as it all uh, is, uh, known as um, this was before the pandi pandemic happened, and you know the talk of the town was getting into this new industrial revolution. Uh, how Cambodia will be able to leapfrog into this industrial revolution because Cambodia is you know uh, slightly behind in terms of technology and all that. 
So this was one of the reason why we needed to push into that sector. We wanted to develop our labor force. It's a very young and vibrant labor force that is very open to new learning, um, very susceptible and accepting to new ideas. And this, it was, it was like a, you know, it's like fire catching on, you know, a dry, dry plants. It, it was just when the pe when the kids, you know, they started adopting social media, they started to adopt um, new ways of communication through technology. This was when we re uh, we realized that it's a necessity to ensure that there is a strategy to spearhead um, the the new adoption of technology. Um, I guess um, I guess in short terms, but there is a lot more that I could say, but I don't know if there is the time permit to it or not. I am sure, I'm sure that, I mean, but maybe at this point, do you have a, any personal experiences uh, on, on, you know, your interactions with the young people, because they're the ones that, that's going to take this to that next uh, lap? I do, actually. I am, um, uh, I guess I am, you know, at that age where I'm not as young as I once was, um, I'm, I'm, uh, looks I'm are all my... that matters. So you look young <laughs> enough. Yeah, I'm, I'm in my uh, late thirties now. But what I do realize is that after working with um, uh, some of the new young entrepreneurs, um, you realize that a lot of them are passionate about new technology. You see, some of the uh, the new startups that are coming up, they are mostly in technology. They are developing new. Um, new ways to make, um, uh, uh, to, to do learning, to, to, to teach. They are developing new ways to uh, market homemade or local products. They are developing technologies that, that, that shorten the distance between um, you know, retailers and suppliers. So all of these are very, you know, um, I know that it exists in, in, you know, in more developed world, but for a country, a smaller country like Cambodia, to see such young and bright mind being able to adopt all of these technology and being able to exploit those technology and create real businesses out of it, it's it's a very, it's admirable to say the least. Mm -hmm. And I think for for me in general, I, I find their passion and their belief in what they are doing to be very um, inspirational. And I've I've been I've seen a few very uh, successful ones. Um, I've been watching some of the awards and you you'd be um, surprised to know that some of these new startups are a lot of them are led by women um, and this is in, in, in tech startups as well and this is something I guess we are proud of <laughs> yeah you should absolutely be yeah they hold up half the world remember that <laughs> <laughs> So very interesting, um, and, and that brings me to, to a question that's asked, it's being asked by a member of our audience. So this is from Mohammed Abdel Magid. And uh, you know, there is no doubt about the fact that electronic trade will increase. The question is, does that actually uh, deny or, or lessen the importance of the traditional trade? I don't know, maybe Mr. Martins, you'd be able to respond to that because you've got such a big market, both rural, uh, uh, urban, modern, traditional. Do you see traditional trade diminishing in the light of this boom in e-commerce? No, I, I don't see that happening at all. What I think will happen is suddenly uh, you're addressing a larger market. So you'll be able to sustain your business in a stronger way and you'll be able to reach out to communities that you couldn't touch before. And uh, this should help you go on with your business and develop it in a, in a better fashion. And it, it doesn't mean you need to give up your brick and mortar business or your traditional way of doing business. You're just adding another way of doing it to your, to your panel of options. Ms. Chondro, do you have a view on that? Again, Indonesia, archipelago, what? 7,000 inhabited islands, 16,000 in total. So we're talking about a huge population of rural as well as, well, mainly rural uh, with some urban populations. Do you see that actually diminishing or in, in Indonesia? I actually want to reinforce um, what was said in Brazil that in Indonesia, it does not happen that way because um, as it happens, um, a lot of people do their business in traditional markets 
in which people sell the uh, vegetables, you know, fish, but daily produce in a uh, wet market in the stall. And in the light of the pandemic, uh, they don't stop their business, but they adopted technology that helps them um, take orders from customers simply by using uh, messaging services, chat services, and then using um, motorist couriers to send their products to the customers. So they are actually adopting technology to help their business grow without um, sacrificing their traditional way of doing business. Indeed, and that's the ingenuity of the human spirit I find absolutely fascinating and it demonstrating over and over again throughout this one year, uh, you know, the, in many ways, what you're talking about, Ms. Chandra, is this hybrid system that even if I don't have full access to technology, I can have half of that and I can still serve, you know, my, my markets uh, um, face to face. So that's been, that's been quite uh, an interesting development. So right now, I'd like to focus this time on the more systemic issues uh, that are present uh, because we really need to look at the entire ecosystem in order to sustain the growth of e-commerce. Um, so specifically, I suppose, um, you know, in, in your case, Ms. Chandra, you know, what's been your biggest hindrance to growth as an e-commerce company in Indonesia? Um, I would have to say that the first uh, biggest hindrance to growth is the lack of clear information exchange between, maybe this is what you're uh, calling the public-private partnership. And I really um, have, a, have a strong response to what was being said by that this partnership should not be done in silos because a one change should be done systemically and not just in one department. For example, Indonesia is a large archipelagic country with, as you said, 16,000 different islands. And one of the main problems that we face as a company who sells our product mainly online is logistics. And um, this is a real story. So people on smaller islands uh, about maybe about a hundred uh, families in that island have no access at all to food and to other products. So they have to carry to ferry any produce, any um, needs at all from the bigger islands, which is at least two hours away. And they are markets that are inaccessible by us. So even the Indonesian postal service cannot reach them. The private couriers cannot reach them at all. So what we can do is what they do when they need their product is they ask someone, their family or friends in the bigger island to ship the products to them in a weekly basis or a, in the ferry that goes maybe every day or just once a week. Mm -hmm. So in the that is where the government is really needed, especially because Indonesia is very large. Yeah, it's a very, very unique issue uh, that Indonesia faces. Um, Mr. Martins, with Mercado Libre, and, and there are quite a few similar questions coming uh, your way at this point. Um, from This one is from Nano Malda. So, uh, and he's asking, and this is actually along my, my, my line of questioning as well. So I understand that Mercado Libre, uh, you, you do facilitate international orders. However, you do not uh, have an exchange of goods uh, between or with uh, between neighboring countries. So if that is a fact, then naturally the question is why? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, we do have cross-border e-commerce uh, from outside the region into the region for supply re uh, reasons, you know, some offerings that are easy, easier to fulfill from outside the region. And indeed, we at this point do not offer cross-border e-commerce e between countries in which we're present because of mainly regulatory issues that we feel will uh, decrease the user experience to a level where it wouldn't be satisfying 
And this is not something that we want to offer to our customers, to our users. And uh, we do work a lot with governments. Don't take this as a, a, a harsh criticism. Uh, we do work with them, but you know we're we're working with the regulations in place, and it's not as easy as, as we would like to change them from day one to day two. So this is why at this point we don't offer that. And I'd like to take the opportunity to build on on Ms. Chandra's uh, point. Uh, Brazil is not an archipelago, but it's a very large country. To take this country as an example, it could could apply to the region uh, as as a whole. Uh, it's hard to. Uh, reach to the populations uh, who are uh, at some in some geographies think of the amazon you know we, we cannot just build roads and and airports and trains etc we have a forest to protect so we cannot just get there the way we would get uh, elsewhere uh, think of uh, um, the the chain of mountains that we have in the region think of central america it's a very broad line of of, of land so um it's, it's the geography really makes it tough to have the infrastructure necessary. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's the, the main uh, challenge we have at this point. Indeed. And, and what about Excellencia Genova? You, you mentioned uh, a couple of times about uh, Kazakhstan being a landlocked country. Uh, wh what's, what's the story with cross-border trade? Uh, cross-border trade is highly important for my country. And uh, we are also working uh, to facilitate integration of businesses, uh, particularly domestic producers, uh, into the international electronic trading platform, such as Alibaba. And uh, mm -hmm. we have already almost 100 domestic companies trading uh, their products uh, on the Alibaba platform or using the Alibaba platform. And over 4,000 Kazakhstan's goods have been traded and uh, in 2021, we would like to have another 50 companies also trading their goods through the Alibaba platform. So I also would like to mention, you asked the question about what are the hurdles for businesses. From government's perspective, it's also a lack of skills and capacity, particularly for small and medium-sized enterprises. I think large companies, they can uh, easily adapt to the new situation, particularly to the lockdown and COVID, and they were managing their traditional businesses uh, with uh, increased online businesses, sales and uh, distribution uh, and logistics services, many other types of services. But for small and medium-sized uh, businesses, it's a big challenge. So what we are doing in order to address this challenge, the government jointly with the National Chamber of Commerce uh, we have very powerful National Chamber of Commerce, uh, which is called Atamikian. So we, have, we are working on uh, the training program, School of Internet Exporter. So that not only large companies who are traditional exporters of goods and services, but also small and medium-sized enterprises will be involved. And uh, we have so far trained around 2,000 SMEs representatives through these uh, online courses. Uh, how to increase the capacity for internet exporters. And we also have created e-commerce centers in four largest cities of Kazakhstan, which is uh, the capital, Nur Sultan, Almaty, uh, second largest city, it's the first largest city by the number, former capital, and Karaganda and Shimkian. So in these centers, also small and medium-sized enterprises, they receive training and they also receive uh, the advice and the capacity building uh, exercise on how to use the online platforms and how to trade, both domestically as well as uh, on the international markets. So this is a work which we are undertaking at the national level. And we believe that there is a huge potential uh, because of our neighbors. We are neighboring with China. We are neighboring with Russia, which are large markets. and. Uh, we believe that e-commerce will be creating uh, large opportunities, not only for uh, traditional exporters, as I have mentioned, but also for medium and small enterprises and creating jobs related to e-commerce. So that, that is certainly a, a much needed area to be looking at, um, upskilling upskill, up your, your population. And 
and I'm pretty sure um, Excellency Samheng that this is also something that that's included in the e-commerce strategy. Um, but I just want to turn uh, your attention to this question, uh, which is a very good question asked by Rima uh, El, El, El Khatib. And um, I, I don't know if you're in a position to answer that, but if anyone is in this panel, it'll be you. Um, so, so there is an, a, an observation that there is a lack of international trade rules for e-commerce in the first place. And with this lack, how can a country like Cambodia, which is lagging behind, catch up when there is this, this huge barrier in the first place to international trade for e-commerce? Um, I think that is a wonderful question. I actually noticed that was one of the questions I noticed uh, popped up on, <laughs> on my screen as well. Um, I think this is something that we all have to take to be worrying about um, in a sense, because what you, you do see that there are talks all the time when, you know, the moment Facebook launched uh, the, um, the online payment system that they were going to introduce. And then, and then you, have, you have to wonder uh, in Cambodia, how would, how would, what would happen to the transactions that were going to happen locally? How are we going to tax this? How are the, um, the, the consumer be able to get protection from it? when the government in Cambodia itself is not in charge of the policy that affects Facebook. So these were some of the issues that we had to take into account. And what we do realize is that I, I, during my FGDs that I, I met with a lot of the representative from the private sectors, they did mention that um, there was a need for the e-commerce law, which we had launched, as well as the consumer protection law which we had launched. And I think one of the ways that countries like Cambodia um, could address these type of issue is to always be aware of the demands from the private sectors. And this is one of the reasons why Cambodia, uh, especially the government and the Ministry of Commerce has worked so hard to work co and si uh, side by side um, with the private sectors. Uh, always, if you see that the e-commerce strategies that we came up with, it actually has um, a bit of the private sector in every single page. We did not come, at, uh, come up with it by uh, ourselves. And this is something is, you know, uh, passionate by our partners, the EIF in collaboration with UNDP as well. So I think it's to be aware of the current system, a system that is continually changing, growing. And it's, it's hard to really identify a one solution. It's, if, you're not, if you are unable to adapt the, to the constant change, you will, not, you will lag behind. And I think it's, it's one of the benefit as well in that because there is no um, concrete international law and Cambodia being one that is lagging behind are able to catch up with the, you know, the more developed countries in terms of policy makings, in terms of framework drafting a lot quicker um, than per se in other fields of, of, of policy making. And we, are, we also have ways to learn from it. We also have more um, rooms to move as well because it's a slightly more flexible for us coming you know, from the back and being able to adjust to the current changes in the environment. So I guess flexibility and being able to adapt is one of the key. I'm going to put you in the spot right now and ask you, can you share an example of how this flexibility worked for you or how you managed to wheel your way through uh, <laughs> through the system? Yeah, um, this for I think for I, for me personally, I think uh, I, ha I hold on to the mindset that um, if there are complaints from the private sectors, there is some issues that you have to deal with. So every time I go into a, a forum or, and I do this very often, I go into forums and I meet with um, uh, different types of um, new startups in technologies, hearing them complain, hearing them uh, uh, come up with issues to, to address. Initially, we had issues relating to things like there is a lack of um, dialogues between, you know, uh, B2, uh, uh, private public dialogues. And once that was established, now the ecosystem is a bit more available and, you know, we hear more from the private sectors. And after that is a bit more, um, you know, there's more communication. The, the current complaints now is more related to access to finance, access to market. 
and then act, now it's it's starting to move towards access to um, how do you say this relevant um, skills. So I, I've mentioned to you that the you know in Cambodia there is a young and dynamic um, population that is all ready to ad adopt any techno technology very quickly. There is a, a, a labor a labor force that is full aware of IT, but the particular skills for a, a certain types of job isn't as as readily available. So this is one of the, the things that we are uh, having to deal with. And I think for me in general is, is basically to analyze all of these complaints and bring it up as a talking point to all of other policies maker, because of course, I'm not the only one person that is drafting all of these laws. There's a lot of cross-checking and there's a lot of ministry. I think as one of our colleagues, Ms. Ms. Chandra has mentioned, there's a lot of and during the presentation as well, all of these ministry has to be informed when a new law is draft. All of these people has to be, you know, cross-checking all of these laws. So mm -hmm. of course there's all of these red tapes, but getting to know what is needed, I think is the key. Is Mr. Martins, you deal with governments a lot throughout the region. That's that's your main task. Have you had experiences with such open and transparent uh, uh, policy makers like and, uh, uh, Excellency Sam uh, Actually, I, I was, you probably saw me nodding here because he was making some excellent points. And those are exactly the, the same discussions that we have here. And uh, I'm glad to say that, yes, we have had discussions with some very good uh, forward looking uh, decision makers, policy makers, such as uh, mm -hmm. himself. And the point about the skill set of the people that you might want to engage with and, uh, you know, the uh, people you might want to work with, that's absolutely critical. You cannot build a company on people who don't have the skill set for it. Yeah. Right. So thank you very much for that. Now, um, I, I am fully aware that even as we talk about e-commerce in the context of developmental changes, uh, we would be remiss if we do not have a voice from Africa. So we've got people from Central America, Southeast Asia, uh, Latin America, but not Africa. So to this end, therefore, I am very happy to call on a representative from that region who can just spend some time to give us a glimpse of what's happening over there. And she is the Regional Coordination Specialist at the Regional Service Center for Africa for the UNDP, United Nations Development Program. Ifi Ogo joining us from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Welcome. So what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on this development of e-commerce in the light of COVID-19? Right, thank you very much for having me. Um, I think that e-commerce has shaped the world and Africa is not spared. Uh, if anything, I would say that it has in some ways boosted our approach to e-commerce. Now, while the responses to the pandemic are reflective of the diversity of the continent, you know, depending on where you are, e-commerce is used in, a, in various ways. But I think we can look at our responses with e-commerce from three main perspectives. Firstly, of the consumer, secondly, of the firm, the enterprise or the business, and thirdly, from the public sector. So if we start with the consumer, as with everywhere else, you know, there, there, there was an increase and in uptake in the use of e-commerce channels. Uh, what I find interesting is that payments, which is often cited as the problem of e-commerce, commerce on the continent. Well, uh, during COVID-19, during the pandemic, what we found is that there was actually an increase in use of e-payments channels. So we have one company who that works throughout the, the continent that reported that actually what they saw was five times increase in the use of their payments channel. In Nigeria, as well, for, for example, there's a boom for fintech because you found that most more people were interested in investing, interested in investing through fintech and interested in investing in markets outside of Nigeria and outside of the continent. So that's one example from the consumer perspective. And now if we look at the enterprises, what you'll find is that there's been what I would term an explosion of new products and services. You're talking about content streaming, you're talking about investment services, you're talking about e-logistics, e e-healthcare, education. Now, some of these you know, services were there prior to the pandemic. But what you, you've seen is that they have really, really grown, acquired new new, um, new service users, and there have been more services that have entered the market space. And so if we now look, say, from the public sector point of view, one thing we've seen across board is that there has been increased engagement with stakeholders. You find a lot more co 
consultation, you find that there's a lot more of saying, okay, how can we work together to understand how to go forward with this? An example of what this led to is that you have a public sector would say, oh, we will work with whoever will provide um, financial services to take down the fees on transfers between people. And so that's one way that we have seen things have improved or things have been enhanced. We also see a bit more of integration of tech and e-commerce into trade and travel formalities. For example, in Cameroon, you can now pay for some public sector services for import and export through FinTech. Same thing in Togo, where, you, where the public sector created an e-platform to provide finances to workers in the informal sector. I mean, that is something that didn't exist prior to the pandemic. And for travel, and I imagine it's the same everywhere else, you have to now upload your data through an e-commerce platform, you, you pay through an e-commerce Platform. So in summary, uh, what we we're seeing here is that there is a willingness, and then we're also seeing a lot of capacity to deploy e-commerce and tech for a range of purposes across board. Obviously, there's still challenges with the cost of data or how many people have access to the internet, but one thing we are seeing is that the use of e-commerce in Africa is likely we're going to keep increasing just based on what we have seen through the pandemic. And those could be my views from this side. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ms. Ogo. I think it's, it's certainly a very bright future that you've painted for Africa. So it's about time for us to wrap up this discussion. It has been intriguing. I wish I had more time to, to get into your experiences a little bit more. But maybe at this point, I'm just going to give uh, each of you, each of our four panelists, uh, a little bit of airtime, but maybe just one minute each, one minute each, because we do have to keep to time. Um, since we have public and private sector representatives here, I'd like for you to sound out uh, to each other what's at the top of your wish list when it comes to collaboration with the other stakeholders. So let's start off with Excellency Samheng. What's on your wish list? for better collaboration with the private sector? I think one of the things that I'm most passionate about is to help the accelerators make things real, make things happen. The VCs help them get straight to the entrepreneurs and get startups successful. So I think that's one of the things that I'm more passionate about. Wonderful, great. And what about um, Excellency Ijanova? Uh, you know, what, what's your hope? in the area of international cooperation in e-commerce? Ah, thank you. It's a very big question. And <laughs> uh, I uh, would like to speak about my passion in e-commerce. I'm a chief trade negotiator, and uh, uh, we are negotiating in the WTO a future uh, global framework on e-commerce. And uh, I believe that we need global regulations in e-commerce. Of course, there should be a balance between flexibilities for entrepreneurs, allowing them innovations and further rapid development, as we see now, uh, but at the same time, for the protection of consumers, as well as businesses, there should be a legal framework. And what we are negotiating now is very complex. So what uh, here I would like to mention, uh, the project which I'm working currently in Wolfi, is with the United Nations Conference for Trade and Development and ITC, International Trade Center. We are working on a development of a legal framework for e-commerce in Kazakhstan. So we, uh, we have two uh, major objectives. First is to create an enabling legal framework on e-commerce in Kazakhstan. And second, to make us able to negotiate skillfully in, and protect our interests in the global negotiations on e-commerce in the WTO. So I would like using this opportunity to thank these two organizations who are helping us on uh, enhancing our skills to negotiate and to work on the development of legal framework. Thank you. Indeed, thank you very much. And what about Ms. Chondro, your parting shot? Um, how would you like to see your government realistically helping SMEs like yourself take advantage of this digital boom? I've been really inspired by what His Excellency Sameng and Her Excellency Adzunova said. Um, particularly in Indonesia, I think the role of the Ministry of SME and Cooperatives is very 
um, critical, especially the, because they can collaborate with the private sector accelerators to increase the skill sets of the SMEs. And then the Ministry of Trade can actually Okay, Ms. Chandra, you are going off. All right. So I think. Okay. Well, Ms. Chandra seems to be having a little bit of a problem with her with her internet access. She did mention that the evenings are usually quite bad. So let's. Um, End of them with uh, Mr. Martins. Mr. Martins, um, what is what do you think will be the most effective and most immediate thing that governments can do to accelerate the sustainability as well as the growth of e-commerce? Okay, well, um, I cannot uh, avoid the opportunity to say that internet infrastructure is absolutely key to this. As we can see, and now Ms. Chandra is having trouble. It has happened to me on other <laughs> occasions, so I'm not making fun at all. I'm just pointing out that it's important. It um, is. It, it, I think the key concept here is to be user-centric. What we need to think really is what is all this for? You know, trade, e-commerce, platforms, access to technology. It re it's really built to have people be able to sell and buy things on the internet and be able to get on with their oh, lives and their businesses. Um, okay. So I where think was I? to be user-centric with think, low, okay. um, uh, the can, Sorry, Ms. Pondra. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, Mr. Martins is uh, speaking right now, so if you'd allow him. Yeah, I'm, so I'm just concluding fast. Um, I think we need to be user-centric from a private perspective and the public perspective. You know, public services users are as important as private services users, and we can come together around this concept to develop good policies. Indeed. Thank you very much for your thoughts, Ms. Martins. And indeed, what's happened to Ms. Chondro is really a live demonstration of some of the system issues that uh, we're all faced with, whichever part of the world we come from. So I'd like to say a big thank you right now to all the panelists who have taken valuable, invaluable, shall I say, invaluable time to spend with us, to give your insights and, and just to be so candid about uh, your thoughts. So once again, the permanent uh, representative of Kazakhstan to the United Nations, Your Excellency Zana Aichinova, thank you very much for being with us. The Under Secretary of State at the Ministry of Commerce in Cambodia, Excellency Samheng, thank you. And we have the Director of Government Relations and Public Policy of Mercado Libre, Francois Martins, appreciate your time very much. And of course, finally, if you can hear me, the founder of Peak Me Naturals in Indonesia, Alan Chan Chandro, thank you for your time and battling through this bad internet connection with us. Interesting. So at this juncture, as we approach the close of this event, we are privileged to be able to have uh, the president of the United Nations General Assembly to be here to give us his closing remarks. Your Excellency Volkan, Bosch here, stage is yours. Okay. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to address uh, the closing uh, of this uh, important meeting. Uh, your discussions today around the role of commerce uh, during the pandemic and uh, the challenges faced uh, by individuals, businesses and governments in digitization are much appreciated. And the lessons learned during this period will be uh, many, and we cannot overstate the importance of understanding the obstacles so many have faced in shifting to a more digital world. Looking ahead, the trend towards e-commerce is likely to continue throughout recovery from COVID-19, becoming part of the so-called uh, new normal. It is therefore important that we recognize the challenges and take steps uh, to support governments and citizens as they continue to embrace uh, this new way of working. 
doing so requires that we work to expand connectivity and close the digital divide. But it also means that uh, we work to build capacities and remove the barriers to opportunity. Today's discussions and the work of Antat broadly have underscored three critical areas where greater efforts are needed. First, uh, we need to work with, with governments uh, to put in place the necessary policy changes and institutional architecture for e-commerce. This means amending legal and regulatory uh, frameworks to improve security and putting in place the digital systems uh, needed to enable online payments and other forms of e-commerce. Second, and concurrent to the first point, is the need to strengthen the capacities of local businesses and entrepreneurs. It isn't enough for the digital ecosystem to exist if people are unable to access it. We have to work to ensure that people everywhere are offered the skills and capacities needed to become part of this rapidly emerging online marketplace. And finally, we, the global multilateral system, must uh, prioritize these efforts and support them as broadly as, as we can. With the Sustainable Development Goals as our framework, and with an eye to expanding digitization and leaving no one behind, the UN and partners, particularly those in the development sphere, must support national and local plans and ensure that these are incorporated into recovery from COVID-19. To fulfill the recommendations I have just outlined, greater and truly universal connectivity is a must. This means extending digitization to least developed countries, landlocked developing countries, and small island states, as well as to women and girls and other marginalized groups who are far too often the last to benefit from global advances. E-commerce offers immense potential across the SDGs with particularly clear benefits in efforts to combat poverty, reduce inequalities, provide quality healthcare, enhance jobs and livelihoods, and to improve gender equality. Uh, efforts, therefore, must be made to harness this rapidly emerging uh, tool. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the barrier of the digital divide, which was real long before COVID-19, is a challenge which can be removed through our collective efforts and international support. I'm therefore quite pleased that the UN system is leading this conversation. In this regard, I will be convening a one-day high-level thematic debate on digital cooperation and connectivity on the 27th uh, April. And this high-level thematic debate will be held under the team Hall of Society Approaches to End the Digital Divide. And it will provide a platform for frank exchanges amongst relevant UN entities technology leaders, constituents, and stakeholders to further align work in support of member states', member states needs. The provisional program for the thematic debate was circulated on March 10th, so I, I, I'm sure you'll be able to have a look at it. It is my hope that these expert discussions, coupled with high-level political statements of intent and support, will build momentum and mobilize the international community to strengthen existing multi-stakeholders initiatives and partnerships and support the creation of additional partnerships to accelerate implementation. It will also encourage member states to be more engaged in digital governance as that will allow them to be part of the decision-making process. In closing, I must emphasize that the international community has both a moral and practical obligation to address digital inequalities. To do so would both expedite efforts to eradicate poverty 
and empower people everywhere, as well as fuel economic growth at all levels. This offers the possibility of new markets and sectors and is an economic win for all stakeholders. I hope you will join us in making this event a success. I thank you once again for the opportunity to join you today. I wish you all the best in your endeavors. Thank you very much, Excellency Bosquia. Indeed, everyone, mark your calendars 27th of April, the high level dialogue, very important for all of us to get involved and, and, and just rub uh, and with, with iron sharpening iron. So at this point, as I said, uh, we'd like to invite the Acting Secretary General of UNCTAD to come back on stage to tie up loose ends and give us a parting shot. Ms. Isabel Duhon, please. Thank you, Karen. And uh, having partially listened to your discussion, uh, it's obvious that we are all agree that COVID-19 has affected all countries, but at different levels. And we also all agree on the fact that it's important, even crucial for developing countries to catch up the train, the digital train. But I would like to insist on two uh, issues. First and foremost, um, the question of, of unfair distribution of the economic benefit of digital economy. Because you know, or maybe you don't know, but that US and China account for 75% of all patents uh, related to blockchain technology, for instance. 50% of global spending on internet of things. And 90% of the market capitalization value of the world's uh, 70 largest digital platforms companies. So it, it shows very clearly that there is an unfair distribution of the economic benefit of this digital economy. And it's more than ever important that developing countries could jump and become active player in this world and not only a consumer uh, in this aspect. So also because they have, we, it was said uh, often in the afternoon, they have uh, the biggest young population. And it's why also it's so important for them to jump in that. Second thing that I would like to say, it's digital and tech is not only a sector, it's a vector for development. And that's key because it's important that really the developing countries could benefit of that for them and for their development. It's not only a question of uh, benefit as such for the traders. It's so important to give the possibility to people, the population in developing countries uh, to, to have benefit of this digital tools. Finally, as it was just said by the president of the, 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 the General Assembly, the collaboration and the cooperation between all the partners is key. And it's why we started with this E-Trade for All uh, uh, network, which is a network with a lot of more or less 30 uh, UN bodies plus private sector and a lot of people in order to really uh, put together our forces because the challenge is, uh, is huge. So um, thank you to all of the participants, uh, so those I see, but also those that I don't see because they are uh, 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 under the screen. And I hope that the 27th of April, or even of course, every day, we could work together in this, uh, in this field. Thank you so much and thank you, Karen. Thank you very much, Mr. Horn. Uh, and, and many thanks to all of you, the audience for joining us on, in on this dialogue. And this is really what we've been on about, dialogue and cooperation and collaboration. And you're joining us in this uh, uh, event is very important to us because we believe that that is the way forward. So on behalf of E-Trade for All, I'd just like to thank you. And we do hope that you'll walk away, not just with information, but really with concrete action. And hopefully it would inspire you to do something more for your community. Um, so we've seen clear evidence of the, the exponential growth of e-commerce. We've seen how technology has come into the forefront of our lives like never be before. We're even buying toilet paper online now. But let's not forget this, that our experiences is not necessarily everyone else's. And because the truth is, the rich will get richer and the poor will get poorer if we are not taking intentional steps 
to flatten the curve. And I'm not just talking about stemming the virus, but I'm talking about allowing communities that are lagging behind to catch up. So with that, I would like to wish all of you a most pleasant weekend ahead. Stay safe, be fulfilled, and goodbye. Bye. All right.